bought some gossip here on a uh, Sunday afternoon and I'm having a bit of a, a think about the boxing last night. Obviously the Eubank Quinlan card with David Price, Ryder, etc. Uh, I posted two instant reaction videos after I got home last night. I did one on Eubank Quinlan, one on Price Hamer. Um, this video is going to be a, a, a longer one. I'm going to spend the first part addressing some of the comments that were made on those two videos. Specifically, um, the comments made on my Eubank Quinlan post-fight reaction. Uh, the Eubank hardcore fans uh, were out in force on that particular video and I took uh, a little bit of a kicking with some of the comments. So I wanted to address some of the points raised against that video. Uh, and then I also wanted to talk about some more of the undercard and some of the fights that I didn't get a chance to cover last night. Uh, Ryder Etches, Selby, Chris Congo, Kid Galahad, etc. Uh, and also, you know, obviously just to try and give some impressions of what it was actually like being at the event. Um, because I appreciate that, you know, it's obviously different watching it on TV to watching it live. So let's start by talking a bit more about Chris Eubank Jr. versus Reynold Quinlan. And I want to discuss some of the particular comments that I received uh, against the video that I posted last night. Uh, and I would say that this commentary from this point onwards is is not typically directed at one particular individual's comment. So if I say something that potentially sounds like a comment that you made, uh, I actually got numerous comments uh, that were very similar in nature on a number of these points. So it's not necessarily looking to uh, debate one particular person's point, but more just discussing in general terms. Uh, and the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that, you know, in that post-fight video, if you haven't watched it, I said that I was somewhat underwhelmed by Chris Eubank Jr's performance and that I didn't necessarily myself believe um, that it was a vintage Eubank performance. I said that I felt something was missing, you know, he didn't look like he was on full form. Now, I got numerous comments saying that I had completely failed to take into account the ring rust factor because Chris Eubank Jr had actually been out of the ring for eight months and that uh, there was perhaps a flaw in my analysis because I hadn't necessarily considered this and mentioned it when I was making my video last night. Um, let me say, I completely disagree with that as a point. Uh, if you are someone who are saying Eubank's performance last night was a bit dodgy because of ring rust, I think you're drinking the Eubank Kool-Aid too much and I think your, your, your logic is a bit flawed. Let's have it right. Chris Eubank Jr. and Chris Eubank Sr. are now branding themselves as a world champion. This was a world championship level fight, um, according to the Eubanks. Uh, they are now talking about fighting only at the upper echelons of the sport. The names that they've been calling out, Gennady Golovkin, Andre Ward, James DeGale, Billy Joe Saunders. All of those individuals are world title holders. Several of those individuals would be considered the top fighter in their respective divisions. So. Let's have it completely right here. Chris Eubank Jr. is branding himself as a world champion. They're talking about only fighting the best. They're talking about elite level matchups. Um, how can we say that Chris Eubank Jr.'s performance was poor after being out of the ring for eight months due to ring rust? Look, when you get to that sort of level, when you're talking about world championship level fights and fighting at the top of the sport, it's not uncommon at all for fighters to have to wait eight months between fights due to the magnitude of the event. Now, don't get me wrong, clearly an eight month gap between fights isn't completely ideal. I totally appreciate that. I'm not saying in a perfect world, Eubank Jr. would have had an eight month break from the ring. Having said that, as a world champion, as someone who takes on or looks to take on the elite level fighters of the world, such as Reynold Quinlan and Andre Ward, sarcasm, um, I don't think an eight month gap is, you know, is a, a necessarily a long gap at all in the context of world championship boxing. I also believe um, that even if there was a lack of sharpness, in my opinion, the, the calibre of the opponent, who granted was better than expected, uh, was still a league or two below Eubank to the point that Eubank would still be able to sow the 
electrifying devastation and roasting that he was uh, forecasting in the lead up to the fight. So I guess all in all, I, I'm saying I don't have much sympathy for that. You know, I think as you get to world championship level fights, and you know, as you seek to make the elite matchups in the sport, the Eubanks are going to have to be more and more uh, used to having eight month breaks between fights. I think that's going to be more and more the norm. Uh, you know, as you as you step up to world title level, you don't see guys like Andre Ward and James DeGale fighting four times a year. It's it's not really what happens when you're fighting at the top of the sport. Two to three fights a year is, is much more the norm, to be frank. Um, so do I have sympathy for that? No. Let's also not forget that Eubank Jr. Um, did have a fight announced in between that absence, Tommy Langford, and was at least some way into a training camp for that fight, presumably, uh, before the fight was called off. So it's not like he's just spent eight months necessarily sitting on the sofa and you know going out on the town with his mates. Let's not forget this is a guy who, according to him, has never had a beer in his life. Uh, so do I have sympathy for the eighth month absence out of the ring? Absolutely not. And against Reynold Quinlan, who, as I say, was better than expected, uh, but still nowhere near the same league as Eubank, I didn't expect to see a reduced performance from Chris Eubank Jr. Um, let's move on to a second point. A number of comments that I received on this in my previous video was how good the Eubank jab was. Uh, that Eubank dominated the fight behind a jab, that Eubank controlled the fight, that Eubank completely destroyed Quinlan with the jab, and you know, really what a good job Eubank's jab was. Again there, that's something that I have to completely disagree with. For me, um, Eubank has never been a fighter who is adept on the outside. There are numerous examples that I can give of this. For me, in the Billy Joe Saunders fight, you can almost say Billy Joe Saunders won every round that was fought on the outside, and Chris Eubank Jr. won the majority of the rounds that were fought on the inside. Even if you take a lower level opponent, the Tom Doran fight, Tom Dar Doran was enjoying great success against Chris Eubank Jr. from the outside, and it was only when Chris Eubank Jr. bought the fight inside the pocket that he won. Now, don't get me wrong, Chris Eubank Jr. is an elite world-level fighter fighting inside the pocket, fighting up close. I'm not disputing that. Um, but the idea that he's developed some sort of Vladimir Klitschko-esque jab overnight is, for me, flawed. Um, I was ringside last night, and I did see Eubank pumping the jab, um, but I didn't see it having a, a devastating effect. I question the accuracy and the snap behind that jab. And fundamentally, I don't think Eubank Jr. really ever commits to his jab because he's not a fighter who's minded to win rounds behind a jab. For him, the jab is a necessary en route to doing what he likes to do, which is taking the fight up close and in range. Personally, I think that sometimes Eubank Jr. starts behind a jab for the first two or three rounds because he doesn't necessarily want to blow his opponent out there too quickly. And I think he'd be uh, increasingly mindful of that last night against Reynold Quinlan, given that this was his pay-per-view debut and not wanting to have the fight over in a round or two, given how unknown Quinlan was and, you know, have a load of fans saying that it was a crap matchup and disappointed. Um, but I think Eubank Jr. from the outside is a very flawed fighter. One point I made in my video last night, which I stand by, is for me on the outside, He's very, very guilty of sitting back and admiring his work. On five or six occasions, I witnessed him land something telling on Reynold Quinlan. Um, and then he just stayed. You know, he threw a right hand, it landed on Quinlan, and you know, he didn't get on his back foot, he didn't create space, he didn't throw another punch. He just stood there. And five or six times after Quinlan had been caught, he caught Eubank relatively flush. Five or six times I witnessed that because Eubank was guilty of admiring his work from the outside. For me, he isn't a legit outside fighter at world level. He really isn't. Um, that's his jab. That's his defensive game from his outside. Um, that's the accuracy of his work from the outside. That's his ability to deal with a moving, bobbing, weaving fighter from the outside. I just don't believe that Chris Eubank Jr. is the complete article on the outside and from long range. And that's not really surprising if you look that he's got a, a relative 
low level amateur pedigree um, and fundamentally this is a guy who excels up close you know so all of this talk about the Eubank jab and the Eubank outside game for me I think when he comes up against a guy who really is capable from the outside be that a uh, George Groves who for my money is the best jab in British boxing or be that a, uh, a Billy Joe Saunders who out jabbed him previously in their first fight I think I suspect that Eubank Jr's outside game will be found just as lacking as it was first time round because um, even against the lower level of opposition the Reynold Quinlans, the Tom Dorans he's getting caught he's being inaccurate from the outside and those flaws I expect will be exacerbated substantially um, when moving to a legit world class opponent uh, so, so those were two misconceptions that I felt I think people are giving the Eubank outside game far too much credit uh, I actually listened to Ultratech Sports' piece on the fight, and yeah, I think he had similar sentiments to me that from the outside, Eubank Jr. is, is half the fighter that he is on the inside. Uh, I also thought that the um, the eight months ring rust comment was was a little bit bizarre. Um, you know, after the fight, they've been talking about still going down to 160 and that sort of thing. Um, I think Eubank Jr. is potentially in a difficult place weight wise. I really do. Um, Eubank Jr. for me, as I said in my video post weigh-in, I did a video reacting to the weigh-in between Quinlan and Jr. And I said in that video, I, I think Eubank Jr. Is, is now too big to ever make 160 again. Um, I know Eubank disagrees with me, or at least publicly disagrees with me. Um, but looking at his physique when he stepped onto the scales at 168 pounds, I don't believe that at this stage, now age 27, now having made 168 for a fight, he's going to be able to get down to 160 again. Now, a lot of people who are various know-it-alls in the comment section have said things like, oh, it's easy, he'll just um, dehydrate the eight pounds. That's not really how it works. You know, I've spoken to people who know about sports science and nutrition on this. Chris Eubank Jr., when he stepped on the scales at 168, was lean as hell. There wasn't eight pounds of water weight he could just conveniently lose. You know, it's not as simple as I think people who aren't surrounded by the sport don't understand this. You don't just walk into a sauna with a physique as dry as Chris Eubank Jr.'s at 168 and walk out at 160 pounds. To cut down eight pounds, which is well over half a stone, um, for me is going to be a painful, painful process for Chris Eubank Jr that will be detrimental to his performance at fight night. And that always gets harder as you get older. That always gets harder as your body has experience of fighting at a higher weight class. Um, you know, so I, I think that's a difficult thing for him because I actually think that he's gonna struggle at 168 pounds. You know, a lot of people have been very critical of his power last night. And for me, it's clear, uh, whilst Renan Quinlan was tough, whilst Renan Quin Reynold Quinlan appeared to have a decent chin, um, it, it was apparent that Eubank Jr., who was never a big knockout puncher, even at 160, uh, clearly isn't necessarily going to be a massive one-punch hitter at 168 pounds. Uh, where he excels, as we've talked about before, is overwhelming opponents in the pocket, roughing up opponents on the inside. And I think he found it harder to do against Ronald Quinlan last night than he's done in the past against guys like Spike O'Sullivan, Nick Blackwell, Tom Doran. Why? Because Reynold Quinlan was a substantially bigger man. He was a genuine super middleweight. As such, he was stronger. He was less uh, physically dominated by Chris Eubank Jr. Um, so I, I think there could be tough times ahead for Eubank as he steps up in class. Um, because I don't think he can comfortably make 160 again. Just my opinion. We'll have to see. You may disagree. The proof will be in the pudding. Um, and the pudding certainly won't be on Chris Eubank Jr.'s plate if he's trying to make 160. Um, but I predict tough times because I think at 168 pounds, he's not got the power to blow these guys out. He's not going to have the size to completely dominate these guys in the pocket. Um, and he's not going to have the outside game to deal with, you know, the real moving jabbers, the George Groves of this world, that, those sort of characters. Uh, so I predict tough times ahead for Chris Eubank Jr. I, I really do. Uh, I think that. And I said this pre-fight, I think there's a lot of fighters who enjoy success at a weight class 
um, and they're a beast at the weight class. You know, the Martin Murrays, the Arthur Abrahams at 160. But then when they move up, suddenly those physical advantages have, have dissipated. Uh, in many ways, I believe it will be the same with Kel Brook. If Kel Brook steps up and fights at 154, you know, Kel Brook's had a whole career being the big man, the guy with the longer reach, the guy with the bigger frame. You know, let's see what it's like when he's got stepping up against guys his own size and those advantages he's enjoyed in the, over the years have dissipated. Um, so, tough times ahead for you, back. Lastly, I've got two or three comments, some of them in jest, one or two of them clearly not in jest. Uh, there was one particular that called me a hypocrite for attending the event after saying that it shouldn't be pay-per-view. Um, in my opinion, ludicrous comments. Um, if you go to boxing at any level, you buy a ticket and you pay a price to attend. And that's the price of attending an event. It's the same if you go to the cinema, it's the same if you go and see a band, play live, etc. Um, you're going out to be present at an event. You know, I go to your hall to see the boxing on occasion, it's typically 40 quid to get in. And you may know that you're going to see southern area title level boxing. But you're not paying your 40 quid thinking, oh, I could get a world title ticket for 40 quid in an Eddie Hearn show. You're paying for the event. You're paying for being at the arena, you're paying for the atmosphere, you're paying to the access to ringside, etc. Um, I stand by my comments that this fight was not pay-per-view. Um, would I sit at home on my sofa and pay for this fight? No. The fact that I got a ticket to attend the event, which I was able to do with my brother and a friend, um, it's a very, very different thing to um, sitting at home and buying a fight pay-per-view. So I would suggest it's flawed logic to call me a hypocrite for attending the event. Um, you know, feel free to disagree, but you know, I just thought a number of those comments were, were slightly misplaced. As it so happens, uh, you know, anyway, like I'm not gonna ramble on about that, but, but there you go, anyway. First, I've rambled on now for 17 minutes without really talking about any of the, the boxing, but just wanted to address some of those points that I received in the comment section below. You know, as the channel's grown, and I know the channel's still a relatively small channel, but as the channel's grown, um, the comments have gone, you know, uh, through the roof in terms of what they used to be. Uh, and I just uh, can't always respond to each and every comment. So when I'm getting multiple comments that are, you know, four or five comments of the same nature making the same point. Sometimes it's easier to discuss it on video and you know just uh, address these points directly than sitting down trying to type away on an iPhone or you know something of that nature. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts on um, on the Chris Eubank Jr. Reynolds Quinlan comments. As for David Price, uh, funnily enough, a, a number of people saying they don't believe that David Price will retire after this defeat. They believe that you know there will be a route back to him and you know that's the funny thing about the heavyweight division I guess is um, the heavyweight division fortunes can change so quickly because the punches are so big uh, that careers can turn around and you know careers can be rebuilt careers can be lost in a second I mean I guess look at Vladimir Klitschko people would have been telling him to retire if they had Twitter in the same way that they do now Vladimir Klitschko would be getting trolled left, right, and center on Twitter after his second and third defeats, you know. Uh, but he was able to rebuild and come again. Price is clearly not a young man anymore. Um, I guess you could say he's in the summer to autumn of his career. Um, so it's not like he's a prospect who just needs to go back to the gym and work on a few things. Um, you kind of think if David Price hasn't got to the bottom of it now, uh, he probably ever isn't ever going to get to the bottom of it, but I guess we shall see. Uh, looking, I mean, in terms of does he have to retire or not, um, it all comes down to David Price's motivation. Look at Christian Hamer, for example. Christian Hamer was knocked out horrifically early on in his career by Marius Wok. Christian Hamer was absolutely taken to school and beaten up by Tyson Fury when they fought. But Christian Hamer's come again. You know, Christian Hamer's come again. He's rebuilt himself. He's taken his losses, and he's going to beat Erkan Tepper. He's going to beat David Price. He's now in a position to get a big fight. Don't be surprised to see Christian Hamer in a world title fight at some point soon. Uh, he's built his profile. 
He's built his name, he's built his ranking by those return fights, and don't be surprised if someone gives him an opportunity, because his defeats have given him vulnerability that suggests he can be beaten. Um, but his recent performances have, you know, boosted his name, boosted his profile. So, you know, the Christian Hamer is actually a classic example of someone who can take a loss and come back and rebuild their, their boxing career. So, you know, fair, fair play, fair play to him. And can David Price do that? You know, possibly. David Price can come back, fight on three or four Sauerland undercards, fight bin men, win by first and second round knockout, and, you know, get a few ranking points and, and get some momentum. Uh, could he then be used in a big fight? Very, very possibly. Could we see David Price, Derek Chisora, David Price, Dillian White, David Price, Huey Fury. Could we see one of those domestic pay-per-view, sorry, domestic fights on a on a matchroom pay-per-view as a co-main event? Very, very possibly. People love the heavyweights. People love a domestic heavyweight class. So if David Price's pure motivator is money, he probably can carry on. You know, if he knocks out three or four binmen, people will forget what happened. People will give him another chance. People will start saying, Oh, but he's six foot eight and carries massive power. Um, you know, so he, he, there will remain fights out there for David Price if he's motivated purely by the money. Um, similarly, if he's motivated purely by the competition and the will to win, there is actually a thriving British heavyweight division at present. And you know, if Price is prepared to step down a level financially and in terms of level of opponent. He could well be in the mix at English British title level. You know, I'd still watch Price versus Cornish, Price versus Allen, Price versus Lewison, Price versus Akinlade, Price versus Gorman. The problem is these aren't fights that are going to get David Price on pay per view. These aren't fights that are going to get David Price, um, you know, six figure paydays by any stretch of the imagination. So again, it's going to kind of come back to his motivation here. Um, Fundamentally, my belief now is that David Price is finished as a competitive fighter at European level. Uh, I don't think he's going to be able to beat guys like Chisora or White or Hellenius uh, or Pulev. You know, I, I, I don't think he's at that level. I think he's regressed. I think he's got worse. I think he's easier to beat now. Um, so, I think he can probably get fights with those names. You know, I think if he was handled correctly and, you know, as I say, brought back and beat up a few journeymen, I think he'd get in a position to get a fight with one of those guys. But do I think he can win that fight? No. Do I think David Price believes he can win those sort of fights? No. Um, so the question for me is what does David Price want from the sport? You know, what does he want from the sport? Uh, I believe David Price legitimately felt he could win a world championship. I believe David Price legitimately thought he could get himself in a position to fight an Anthony Joshua or a Joseph Parker and have a crack at the world title. I think that's gone now. You know, Price in a sense will always have a puncher's chance. He is six foot eight, he is nineteen and a half, twenty stone, he does punch very, very hard. The difficulty is he's so easy formulate a game plan against. He's so easy to walk down. He's so easy to put him in a position where he's uncomfortable and his arsenal's taken away from him. That whilst he does have a puncher's chance, it's only a half a percent. You know, if Joshua fought Price and Joshua stood there with his chin in the air and his hands down, David Price would have a puncher's chance, yes. But realistically, that's not what Joshua's gonna do. Joshua and his team are gonna look at the blueprint they're going to look at how easy it is to make David Price fold. And they're going to do exactly that. And they're going to do it a lot more clinically than Christian Hammer did it last night, let me tell you. So I believe David Price's career is over if he legit had intentions of being a world champion. If he legit had intentions of reaching the top of the sport. I do think he could work himself back to European title level fights. Although I don't think he could win one of those fights. I think he could just get in a position to have one of those fights if he needs the money. And... You know, maybe if he wants to consider going down the British title route again or the English title route, maybe he could be successful at that sort of level. But higher than that, I just don't think he's got it, I'm afraid. Right, let's talk about the undercard, because um, I still haven't done any coverage of that. I want to start by talking about Andrew Selby. Um, 
I actually met Lee Selby last night. A uh, real gentleman. Lee Selby had so much time for everyone in the crowd. Um, you know, guy stopped for photos. I saw him stopping for photos for 20, 30 minutes. Shout out to Lee Selby. Um, you know, real gentleman. And um, also a big unit as well. Um, you know, I, I, I was surprised how big he was at, bearing in mind the weight class that he fights at, obviously. Um, for me, having met various fighters over the years, having met lightweights, etc., I don't think Lee Selby is a substantially smaller man than the likes of Anthony Crawler. You know, he's a big unit at that weight. Uh, he really is. And uh, anyway, I'm digressing. But I, I, I sat ringside for the Andrew Selby fight. And Selby is clearly somebody who um, has a lot of talent. I know a lot of the guys on my podcast rate him very, very highly. Um, he's got a lot of talent. He's very slick. He's one of boxing's movers. Um, he would be a horrible guy to fight. You know, he's in the ring, everything's moving, the head's moving, the shoulders are moving, the upper body is moving, the legs are moving, the feet are moving. Uh, he is a constantly mobile target. Uh, I sometimes wonder if he's almost too mobile. Um, for me, he was switch switching last night, fighting lefty and righty consistently, but sometimes I wondered if it was without logic or without reason, you know, was it kind of switching for the sake of switching? You know, I saw a piece, again, so again to Ultratech Sports, that he did on James DeGale, where he was talking about how much wasted movement there is from James DeGale. You know, sort of needless circling, which is expanding energy. Um, I kind of wonder if the same thing is present in Andrew Selby's game. You know, there's so much movement. He's obviously in the habit of just moving constantly. But is it always necessary? You know, is, is it needless energy being expended? You know, some of the footwork... Some of the, the circling, some of the upper body movement, you just wonder, was, was there too much of it? Not that it's necessarily ever a bad thing in the pure sense, but is it an expanse of energy that is maybe taken away from him going out and being a bit more destructive? Because in Andrew Selby, you know, when I look at him, one of the, the things that are my concerns about him is that for me, he's still very amateurish. Uh, don't get me wrong, he's so slick, he's so skilled. Um, but he doesn't really sit down on his punches. Um, he's not someone who, for me, um, really has bad enough intentions when he's fighting. He's still very much of the mentality of going out, chipping away, score a jab, have a little run round the ring, uh, you know, throw something else, counter something else, run round, you know, circle, circle, circle. He's not really going out on a seek and destroy mission. And Clearly, he isn't that kind of fighter, neither is, is his brother. I'm not saying he's just got to go out and start bombing opponents out and you know getting involved in brawls and that sort of things. But for me, it was still quite amateur. It was quite pitter patter. It was quite a lot of uh, needless movement. And you know, I just think as he steps up in levels, he may need to sit down on his punches a little bit more. Um, now, I don't know very much about the division he's campaigning about. You know, that clearly, it doesn't appear to be as deep a division as. You know, some of the other divisions in boxing. I don't think he's going to have to go out and beat a Gennady Golovkin level opponent to win a world title. Let's put it that way. Um, so it may be that he, he doesn't, it may be that he's perfectly capable of beating the other world champions in that division already based on his style. Um, but in terms of being the best he can be, um, you know, I, I think he's got to just, he's got to be a bit more, a bit more conscious of sitting down on his punches, committing to jabs, uh, you know, throwing punches with bad intentions and really kind of get out of that amateur mould. He won every round with ease last night. He had a, a massive size advantage over his opponent who really was a, a, you know, I think his opponent was five foot two, five foot three, something like that. And Selby enjoyed a, a massive advantage over him. Uh, I was a little bit disappointed just to see Selby not go through the gears as much as possible. Um, from about round six, round seven, it appeared to me he kind of accepted that the fight was going to go to the distance. I almost felt there was a bit of a sparring session mentality to the fight creeping in. Um, and I, I just don't think that he necessarily pushed enough to go for the stoppage, which will be important in his career if he wants to build himself commercially and make himself a more attractive proposition. Um, but those are my thoughts. I don't want to be too down on him because it was... Yeah, he won every round very comfortably and he looked really, really good doing it. And it may be that the performance he put in last night is already good enough to win a world title in the context of that division. 
Um, but in terms of being the best he can be, I think he needs to get out of that amateur mindset a bit. And he needs to, to commit a bit more. Just my thoughts. Uh, Keith Galahad. Galahad's opponent, uh, Agbeko, pulled out on the day of the fight. Um, there's a number of online rumours as to why that happened. Uh, the reason given last night was illness. Um, clearly that's quite disappointing, especially for Kid Galahad, whose career has really suffered from a lack of momentum uh, in the past couple of years. Clearly we had the issue outside the ring with his brother spiking his drink, which led to a, uh, a drugs ban. Um, and you know he hasn't really had a notable fight for a good while. And the guy he was in with last night, um, you know, who I think he had something like a 10 win, 20 loss record, something of that nature. Um, clearly wasn't there to, to fight a guy of Kid Galahad's level. And we didn't really see very much from Kid Galahad. It was, it was a bit of a, a clumsy, awkward fight that ended with the opponent being pulled out early on his stool, and, and rightly so, because yeah, the fight was so uncompetitive and the fight was... You know, sometimes it was so uncompetitive, it was, it was bordering on dull being frank. So... Uh, I was actually relieved not to have to sit through another three rounds of it when the guy was pulled out after his stall. But, um, you know, Galahad's talking about fighting the likes of Scott Quigg, those sort of guys. That's a fight that I'd like to see. Uh, do you know what? I've, I've seen a few Kid Galahad fights, and I know people rate him very highly. Uh, I think Jet on the podcast rates him very highly, although I'll need to check in with Jet on Wednesday to, to get more thoughts on that, because I may be misquoting him, but... You know, I've never seen anything from Kid Galahad that tells me he's a definite world champion in the waiting. You know, never, never seen anything of that nature. And um, I'll be impressed. I'll, I'll be impressed if he can go out and beat a guy like Scott Quigg. I really would. Um, I'd be surprised as well. But you never know. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes, I guess. Um, moving on. John Ryder fought Adam Etches in a fight that was bizarrely at £168. Um, you know, it was interesting because for me, Etches looked like the bigger man. But Etches, for me, was a bit flabby at 168 pounds. Whereas John Ryder looked very strong and very, in very, very good shape. I don't know if he's been lifting a lot of weights, but in the ring, I thought he had a big, thick back, um, big arms, you know, big chest. I thought he looked powerful, powerful at the weight. And maybe the improved performance that we witnessed from John Ryder, and to be frank, it's the best performance I've ever seen from John Ryder last night. Um, maybe that improved performance came from not sucking himself down to 160 pounds. I actually believe that he's in a similar position to Chris Eubank Jr. weight-wise. Um, it may be hard for John Ryder to make 160 pounds again, I'm not sure. Uh, it may mean that if he were to make it again, it would have a negative impact on his performance compared to last night. But John Ryder is clearly not a 168 pound fight fighter. And whilst I've got some questions as to whether Eubank will be successful at 168, Unfortunately, I'm certain that John Ryder won't be successful at 168 because he's just too small. He's just too small. Um, the guy, has, he's a really short guy. Um, he lacks the frame. If you stood him next to a George Groves, he looked like a midget. He really would. Uh, or a Callum Smith or a Rocky Fielding, one of those sort of guys. Um, so I think John Ryder may actually find himself in a bit of no man's land in terms of the weight class as well. Um, but let's be, let's be fair, he, he boxed very, very well last night. I, I scored the fight something like maybe eight rounds to two in John Ryder's favour. And I fought, on, on, sorry, it was a 12 round fight. I think I gave Etches two or three rounds, no more. You know, I really had Ryder winning the fight very comfortably. And Ryder, for me, looked a level above in terms of skill. I remember saying to the guys I was with that, um, you know, the only danger of John Ryder losing this fight is if he has a collapse like he had in the Nick Blackwell fight, where he. His stamina just completely left him and he was completely drained of gas tank mid-fight because he looked a level above Etches. He was boxing very, very nicely out of the southpaw stance. And I was surprised because I thought Etches really, really struggled with the southpaw stance. You know, Etches is obviously trained at the Ingle gym. They've got southpaws galore. Um, you'd think that he would have maybe had a better game plan to deal with John Ryder. But the combination of Ryder being so short at the weight and getting low and the combination of him being a southpaw really, really caused difficulty for Etches. You know, Etches wanted to come out, get behind a jab, get that jab pumping. I saw Etches throw jab off the jab off the jab that just missed completely. He, he totally failed to get the distance against John Ryder. Totally failed. Um, Etches' jab was completely ineffective against John Ryder. 
and defensively Etches was open as hell. Yeah, every time John Ryder threw a hook on, on the inside, every time John Ryder threw an uppercut, he landed more uppercuts last night than Eubanks, and that's saying something. Um, you know, every time Ryder threw a punch of that nature, he hurt Etches. He hit Etches clean and he hurt him. And a few occasions in this fight, Etches looked badly wobbled, and I thought Etches was going to get stopped. So credit to Etches for uh, hanging in there and for you know, showing huge heart to stay in the ring in a fight that he was losing badly. Um, Ryder did impress me. He looked skilled. He looked skilled. He looked like he was hitting a bit harder. He looked skilled in there. Um, and he looked just a complete level above Etches, technically. Now, we can debate till the cows come home how good Etches is. I mean, is Ryder a level above him anyway? Um, but I thought he looked good. Uh, defensively, Ryder at times was semi-smart as well. You know, I was joking ringside that he looked like Floyd Mayweather at times, which was obviously um, just me being a bit of a troll. But, you know, we saw Ryder adopting a bit of a shoulder roll. We saw him putting his shoulder up, hand up. You know, he, he was he was working nicely in there. He looked quite smooth. It was the best I've seen him. One thing he did do, which was bizarre, is he'd kind of fight, you know, southpaw like this. And I don't know if anyone else noticed this. I don't know if the TV camera has picked up on it. So obviously I haven't watched the, the TV and the commentary. He's got a real tell to his work. So it seemed that every time before he's about to launch into a combination, he punches himself in the face. Seriously, if you haven't seen that, or if I'm the only one who spotted this, go back and re-watch the, the tape. But literally, every time he's about for a punch, he just slaps himself in the face before starting throwing a punch. It was so bizarre. Um, you know, so um, we'll see. But no, I was impressed by Ryder. Ryder's someone I've never been a fan of, actually. I've always thought his fights were boring. I've always thought he snuck mothered his work. I always thought he lacked the, the skill and quality to, to operate at world level or even Euro level. And because of that, I've sort of lost interest in his career. But if he fights like he did last night, there's big fights out there for him and there, there's potential fights out there for him. I hope for his sake he doesn't get stuck in against Eubank next time round. Uh, and I think if he were to... Uh, do that he'd be um, he'd be you know beaten up pretty badly I must say um, but you know there's a there's a live mix at 160 and 168 you know there's guys like um, maybe Rocky Fielding at 168 you know there's guys at, at 160 pounds like uh, Jack Armfield uh, Tommy Langford the guy who beat a go-go is it Craig Cunningham you know there's there's semi-relevant fights for John Ryder out there um and to be fair to him, I know he lost to Jack Armfield, and I actually thought Ryder won that fight, despite the fact I better than Armfield. Um, but there's some form on his resume, you know, the Kaminsky win was a good win, the Etches win last night was a good win. Um, Ryder's someone I'd watch again after last night, definitely. Credit to John Ryder, that was the, the best performance that I've seen of him. And, bizarrely, I've seen a good, good fair bit of John Ryder over the years. But, but anyway... Um, yeah, so that, that was the other uh, major fight on the bill that I didn't cover last night. Quick word for Chris Congo, uh, too slick Congo, who got his opponent out of there in a round. Um, you know, clearly Chris Congo was, fight, you know, he's a G XGB, Team GB squad member. He was twice the size of his opponent. The opponent was a novice from Eastern Europe who'd been brought over to lose. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to get too carried away. But uh, Chris Congo looked, looked dynamite in there. Uh, he looked so fast. Um, his punches looked so hard, so snappy. He looked so big and strong at the weight. Um, he went to the body so well. He put his punches together so nicely. You know, Chris Congo, for me, looked like a real prospect to follow. He's 3-0. Um, you know, he, he's obviously fight, in fights at a certain level. I don't want to get too ahead of myself here. Um, but a real, real exciting prospect. Don't be surprised to see Chris Congo uh, making waves in the sport when it gets to 2018, 2019. This is a, this is a guy uh, whose career is on a, a real, real upwards trajectory uh, from my standpoint. Just a word on the rest of the event and the Olympia. Uh, I've never been to boxing at the Olympia before. Um, I thought it was quite a good venue, actually. Uh, I thought that the... Um, it was kind of set up in many ways in a uh, not entirely dissimilar way to your hall in the sense that it's got like that mezzanine where people could stand around. I think they were for the VIP bar people. Uh, I don't think they were open just to, to all and sundry. 
Uh, but it, you know, it was it was good. It was good. It wasn't sold out at all. I don't know how that's been reported. There were a lot of empty seats in that arena, uh, a hell of a lot of empty seats, and they only had one stand. You know, where there were kind of raised seats. The rest of it was all on the floor. Uh, so I wouldn't know how many people were there. There was a lot of boxing people in the crowd. I saw Hara Davies, um, Gareth Davis, Nick Webb. Um, you know, loads of boxing, more boxing people than you know I can reel off. But there were loads of names. But yeah, it was a relatively. It wasn't a sellout at all. Um, but I thought the Olympia as a whole was quite a good venue. Actually, uh, I don't think it would have been a bad seat in the house last night. Uh, the atmosphere, there were, were peaks and troughs in terms of the atmosphere, certainly, but I thought it was the kind of place where you could build it into a good atmosphere. Um, two slight moans on the venue would be the seating was very, very confusing. Uh, we found our seats without problems, but a lot of the people around us, you know, they had like, the ticket, it was very unclear on the tickets which side of the arena you should be on, basically. And what that meant is a load of people thought they were in someone else's seats and the stewards had to keep coming and pulling people out from in front of you and you had to keep standing up and during the fights there'd be people obscuring your view so the seating ticketing was a bit of a, a little bit of a mess the other thing was that the, you know i know this is a bit of a bizarre thing to mention but the toilet facilities were ridiculous uh you know there was no way that there was one set of toilets in the entire building you had to go downstairs queue up going up the stairs, uh, you know, you'd be stuck there for ages and ages and ages. Uh, I don't know, you know, it really, if they'd sold out the arena, that would really, really be a problem. Uh, so, you know, if they're going to do boxing there again, they're going to have to lay on extra facilities because uh, that was that was a bit of a joke, that was. Uh, but all in all, I thought, I thought it was, you know, a good, good venue and uh, I'd happily go and watch boxing there again, definitely. Um, the show itself, I thought, was was relatively well run. Um, obviously, I'm unaware of. I, I understand the commentary got a lot of stick. I understand the post fight interviews got a lot of stick, um, but I wasn't aware of that actually being there. But no, I thought it, it it flowed relatively well. There was quite a bit of trouble in the crowd actually. Um, it came about 20 seconds before Eubank Jr. actually stopped Quinlan, but there was a big brawl in the crowd. And that kind of had the bizarre thing that half the people were actually watching the brawl in the crowd at the time of the stoppage and missed the, uh, missed the Quinlan stoppage, which, uh, you know, is obviously not what you pay your ticket price for. But but there you go. Um, this is a long video. Just wanted to quickly address some of the comments made on my uh, previous videos. And I also wanted to talk through some of the undercard fights and, you know, give a few shout outs to a few people. So thanks a lot for watching. Uh, I've always in, been interested when I do a longer video like this to see how many people actually stick with it through to the end. Uh, so we're going to do a little bit of a game that we do on, um, you know, I've seen the IFL TV guys do it a few times before. So if you've stuck with me, we're now on minute 42 and a half, and if you've watched the whole way through, uh, can you leave a comment of... Uh, Prince Nassim, Nassim Hamed in the uh, in the comment section. Let's see how many people have watched it through to that point. Uh, but yeah, if you've enjoyed the video, as always, please take the time to hit the thumbs up button. Um, if you're new to the channel, you haven't done so before, do subscribe so you can check out my other stuff. As always, do appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, many thanks indeed for watching the channel and uh, we'll be back very, very soon.